Two weeks after the new year, 1975, in the village of Hiley in Shropshire, a 17-year-old girl named Leslie Whittle was taken from her bed in the middle of the night. On the morning of January the 14th, her mother went to see why she hadn't come down to breakfast. Dorothy Whittle searched the house and found three messages printed on Dymo tape. Leslie's father had started as a bus driver and built up a successful transport business, ending up with 70 coaches. When he died, in his will, he left Leslie 82,500 pounds in trust. When the will was published, newspapers referred to her as an heiress, which was to lead to fatal results. She had been kidnapped, and the kidnapper was now demanding a 50,000 pound ransom. The message said, you are on a time limit. If police or tricks, death. Nevertheless, Leslie's brother Ronald did call the police, who agreed that the family could pay the ransom, or at least appear to go along with the kidnapper's instructions, but only under their supervision. Police searched every inch of the garden and surrounding countryside for clues, but the kidnapper was obviously an experienced criminal who had planned his abduction with painstaking care. Now he told Ronald Whittle that instructions would be phoned to a box at the Swan Shopping Center in Kidderminster that evening. Ronald Whittle was waiting there. But the story broke on the TV news, and the police withdrew him. So when the kidnapper called the box at midnight, he got no reply. The man in charge, Superintendent Bob Booth, was cautious. I can only interpret what's on that tape, and the fact that that girl has now been away from her own home for over 24 hours, that she was taken or left her home with only one garment, and that was the dressing gown that she had on. Uh, by moving an arm, she could have picked up a top coat that she passed as she came down the stairs. And that wasn't even done. So presumably force was used to get her out of the house. That's a, I think that's a fair interpretation, don't you? The next evening, the 15th of January, in a seemingly unconnected incident, the security guard at a transport depot near Dudley in Worcestershire was shot six times by an intruder he challenged. Gerald Smith hovered between life and death for 14 months. But ill as he was, he was able to help towards creating a photo fit of his assailant, which Chief Superintendent Bob Booth showed to the press. He then went on with a vivid description of the gunman. Mr. Smith, I've seen him in hospital, and he says, yes, he said, I go 60% along with that photo fit. That that's the, tr that's the impression I'm trying to get across myself, this hard, wild look when the man is, was pumping bullets into him. The eyes um, are spoken of by Mrs. Grail, and this, uh, th this wild look. The Whittle family was now besieged by newspapermen. Kidnapping is a rare crime in Britain and a young and pretty girl had never been held hostage there before. Well, I would just like her to get in touch with me, if at all possible. I think that, um, if I may come in here, that the um, point is that we... The most important thing is that we want Leslie back. We will do whatever is required. We want the kidnappers to get in touch with me, uh, and I will after receiving reasonable proof that they are who they say they are, I will do whatever is reasonable to get Leslie back. Near midnight on the following night, a call came with Leslie's recorded voice, instructing the ransom carrier to go to a telephone box at Kidsgrove. Mum, go on to the M6 North to Junction 10 and on to the A454 towards Warsaw. Instructions are taped under the shelf. Telephone. Ronald Whittle attempted to follow instructions, but got lost and only reached the box at 3 a.m. It was another half an hour before he found the message that had been left for him, again on Dymo tape. It told him to go to nearby Bathpool Park with the money. He got lost again and only reached the appointed place much too late. There he waited with mounting frustration, talking to the police over a two-way radio. At last, he left not knowing a courting couple had parked there before him and had been puzzled to see the kidnapper's torch flashing.
The kidnapper had been watching all the time through binoculars and, convinced that the police were onto him, had returned to the hiding place where he was keeping the frightened girl, seething with anger and resentment. Next morning, a discreet search of the park revealed no clues, while a more thorough investigation would have found what they were looking for. At this point, the police were anxious to maintain the fiction that they had been unaware of Ronald Whittle's movements. It was one more week before the massive police hunt had its first break. A constable finally got around to checking out a car park just 150 yards from the freight depot in Dudley where the guard had been shot. He discovered that the number plates of an abandoned Morris 1300 didn't match the registration number on its tax disc. On checking, it was discovered that the car had been stolen. When it was searched, a number of startling clues were found. Besides the gun that had been used to wound the security guard, there was a mattress, a tape recording of Leslie Whittle's voice, her slippers, and unused dymo tape messages. There was also a box of bullets which matched those that had been earlier used to kill three other people. Suddenly, the realization dawned that the kidnapper of Leslie Whittle was the same man as an armed intruder known as the Black Panther. During the previous 10 years, more than 400 northern sub-post offices had been raided by a man dressed like this. Harrogate, Yorkshire, February 1974. Donald Skepper, sub-postmaster, was shot by him in the chest and died in his wife's arms. High Baxenden, Lancashire, September 1974. Derek Astin managed to push him down some narrow steps but he escaped, leaving the sub-postmaster dying. Langley, West Midlands, November 1974. Sidney Grayland forced him to take off his mask by squirting ammonia at him and was shot, but his wife managed to get a good look at him before he fractured her skull in three places. 800 pounds was stolen. The post office had offered a substantial reward for the capture of the Black Panther. Now that he had been linked directly to the Leslie Whittle kidnapping, Chief Superintendent Booth struggled to keep up morale. I'm hopeful that uh, we'll get her back to life. This man wants 50,000 pounds. Leslie Whittle uh, comes from a family and the brothers prepared to go anywhere to hand over 50,000 pounds to this man, knowing now who he's dealing with. He would like me to say to the public, uh, please don't hoax us, don't send us annoying calls and things like that. Don't lead us astray, don't con us for the money, because we won't play. We're only going to deal with the man who's going to hand over Leslie, and we'll hand over the 50,000 pounds. Well, I would hope that... Uh, A last public appeal was made. Um, and we've had so many calls, um, some of which are very clearly hoaxes, um, and some which we, we can't be certain of. Um, I, I've been out on certain of these calls, but they've They've led to nothing, but uh, as you can see yourself, the money is here. Um, he's got various means of communication available to him. Um, so if he'll get in touch, the money is there, and I will go alone. I've been alone already, because um, the places that I've been to, I am sure the police haven't been following me. Use whatever communication you feel you can do best by getting hold of that money and releasing that girl. But bear this in mind. We should be after you. You don't have that and get away scot-free. There's no amnesty on this. The police were sure that the best leads would be found in Bathpool Park in Kidsgrove, but they didn't want to risk Leslie's life if she was still alive. At last, on March the 6th, 49 days after the kidnapping, they decided to move. The first major search revealed nothing, but then came an important clue. Bob Booth called a press conference to announce it. Two schoolboys at Kidsgrove have found a tape with a message, drop suitcase in hole in the wasteland at Kidsgrove. This is where the schoolboys had found the torch weeks before, but hadn't given it in. The spot was close to where Ronald Whittle had gone in the middle of the night, but had missed the flashing torch. Now the search of Bathpool Park began in earnest. Hundreds of policemen were drafted in. A 
and all available tracker dogs. When it was discovered that there was an elaborate drainage system under the park, the police concentrated their investigations on that. What they didn't realize at first was that under their feet, British railways had also built a network of tunnels. They were constructed in the 1960s to carry excess water from a new railway tunnel. The new tunnel replaced a low Victorian one, and it was this old tunnel that the kidnapper had planned to use as one of his escape routes if he was surprised by intruders. To service the system, a series of shafts and platforms had been built. The panther had familiarized himself with these and built a camp for himself near the bottom of the main shaft. In the statement he made later, he told the police about his discovery when he was following the railway lines looking for a place where money could be dropped off a moving train. In Bathpool Park, I heard a roaring noise underfoot. I found the noise came from a slightly raised manhole cover. I raised the cover and saw a ladder going down into a shaft. I returned at a later date with a torch and went into the drainage system. After exploring the full complex, I decided this could be used in some way. On the second day of the final search, the police constable climbed into the main shaft of the park's drainage system. To his horror, near the bottom he saw the naked body of a girl hanging by a wire noose from a platform. It was Leslie Whittle, and the post-mortem showed that she had died weeks before. The immediate cause of death was vagal inhibition, which meant that she had probably died of terror and shock rather than strangulation. Britain was appalled by the news. Scotland Yard moved in and put the head of its murder squad in overall charge of the two teams. Up to then, the kidnap murder and the post office killings had been investigated separately, without overall coordination. A bitter Ronald Whittle now revealed the details of his abortive attempt to pay the ransom money. It wasn't just a matter of getting lost. I got slightly lost. That wasn't a long delay. What was a delay was, first of all, the uh, delay in finding the message in the, in the telephone box, which was over a quarter of an hour. And then the, the instructions at the end were not clear. The wall where I was supposed to stop, I didn't even see in my headlights. We shall never know for certain, but I feel, rightly or wrongly, that the way in which this was revealed in the press in the early days could quite easily have me meant a quicker death than might have been for Leslie. With the Black Panther still at large, Leslie Whittle's funeral was a somber affair. On the platform or in the park, the police had found another tape recorder, a sleeping bag with labels which raised hopes of identification. A flash lamp, binoculars, and a foam rubber mattress identical to the one found in the stolen Morris. More than 800 police were now assigned to the combined inquiry. Serial numbers and names and addresses given for guarantees were being tracked down, but all the promising leads came to nothing. Recordings of the ransom demands were played on radio and television in the hope that someone might recognize the voice. The public responded only too eagerly, and more than a thousand people phoned in after a reconstruction of the events was shown on television.
Several different identical pictures were released. None of them, it later turned out, looked much like the Black Panther. Chief Superintendent Booth sounded increasingly distraught. How evil, how ruthless, how terribly wicked this man is that we've hunted for seven weeks. God above, I never dreamt in my wildest dreams he'd do such a thing to a girl. It's, it, it's, it's terrible. Within 24 hours we'll have him if it means pulling every stop out in creation. Unfortunately, Staffordshire have our body, but we want the murderer. I don't care where he's arrested, I don't care by who he's arrested. We'll cooperate with anybody, but the hunt for that man is from here. These people have been working since November, since he came down to Langley and shot somebody. They've been working after that since he shot Mr. Smith, and I've been working non-stop with them for nearly 24 hours every day for seven weeks, and we'll work until we get him. And if we don't get him today, we'll get him tomorrow. But eight more months passed, and despite such attempts as dressing up an actor in clothes the Panther was known to have worn, and filming him in Kidsgrove and Bathpool Park, all efforts drew a blank. Meanwhile, stolen postal orders were being cashed all round the north of England, and newspapers published maps of where the Black Panther was known to have been. But the truth was, that despite all the publicity and the huge police operation which interviewed more than 60,000 people, they were no nearer to catching him. Worse still, there were several unsuccessful attempts at copycat crimes. Fortunately, all the intended kidnaps came to nothing, but the Home Office was seriously worried. Then, on the 11th of December, 1975, came the vital break. Two constables, Stuart Mackenzie and Anthony White, stopped a man carrying a hold-all near a sub-post office in Mansfield, Nottingham. He produced a sawn-off shotgun and forced them to drive to a nearby village. As they slowed in the village, PC White grabbed at the gun. Mackenzie braked and it went off, injuring White's hand. Two customers from a nearby fish and chip shop, Roy Morris and Keith Wood, ran to help and the gunman was subdued after a struggle. As the battered suspect was arrested, the police examined the bag he had been carrying. In it were two Black Panther masks and other incriminating evidence. At first, the man refused even to identify himself, but he was driven to Kidsgrove, and after 12 hours of intensive questioning, his resistance began to crack, and he gave his name as Donald Nielsen, a self-employed decorator from Bradford. Within minutes, police raided Nielsen's house at Grangefield Avenue, Thornaby, Bradford. In a locked attic, they found an extraordinary collection of weaponry and equipment. Faced with this evidence, Donald Nielsen finally admitted to the kidnapping of Leslie Whittle and the shootings of the sub-postmasters. His weaponry included a sawn-off shotgun, a .22 rifle with telescopic sights, crossbows, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. There were also rolls of wire, like that used to hang Leslie Whittle. The committal of Donald Nielsen took place at Kidsgrove on the 30th of March, 1976. He claimed that all the murders had been accidents, but as his story emerged, it became clear that he was an unscrupulous liar and remorseless about the damage he caused. An unloved child whose mother died when he was 10, he was constantly picked on at school because of his real surname, Nappy, a name which no schoolboy could resist teasing him about. National service made him obsessed with fitness and action, and when his businesses collapsed, he turned to armed robbery. When the sub-post offices failed to yield enough money, the report of Leslie Whittle's inheritance gave him the idea for a kidnapping. He spent three years planning and training for it. Hundreds of people waited outside the court to see what he looked like, and an angry spectator made a rush at him.
public anger was such that it was felt that Nielsen would not receive a fair trial in the north of England. So he was sent to be tried for both the murder of Leslie Whittle and the shootings of the sub-postmasters at the Crown Court in Oxford on the 14th of June, 1976. There it was hoped that an unprejudiced jury could be found. The decision to hold the trial in Oxford paid off, and there was only a small crowd as it began. The trial lasted three weeks, and Nielsen pleaded guilty to the kidnapping of Leslie Whittle and demanding a £50,000 ransom. But the judge, Mr Justice Mars Jones, heard him claim to be not guilty of murder, since in the case of each of the sub-postmasters, his gun had gone off by mistake, and Leslie had fallen accidentally from the platform on which he had tethered her with the wire noose. The prosecution pressed Nielsen to explain why he had put the noose round her neck rather than a limb if he had not been ready to kill her. From Nielsen's evidence, it became possible to reconstruct what happened on the night of the kidnap and the following days. Dressed completely in black and wearing a hood, he forced the door and left his ransom messages in the lounge downstairs. Then he crept silently upstairs and woke Leslie at gunpoint. Allowing her to put on only a dressing gown, he forced her downstairs and into the stolen Morris. Gagged and blindfolded, she lay on the back seat, hidden under the foam rubber mattress for the 65-mile drive to Bathpool Park. Once there, the panther led his victim to the main drainage shaft and forced her down the iron ladder. On the platform, he put a wire noose around her neck, clamping it with three metal clips, which he tightened with a spanner. The next day, he forced her to make the tape-recorded messages, which were used to set up the various ransom trails. One of these was intended to lead to the freight depot at Dudley, and it was while he was checking arrangements for the dropping of the money that Nielsen was surprised by the security guard whom he shot. It was because of this he arranged the alternative rendezvous in Bathpool Park. He was waiting there at 2 o'clock in the morning of the 16th of January for a car to turn up. One did, but drove off after a short time, leaving him angry and convinced that a police trap was being set. In fact, it was a courting couple who had blundered in by chance. He raced back to the drainage shaft. He claimed that as he got down to the platform, Leslie Whittle moved to give him room and accidentally fell off the ledge to her death. The prosecution claimed that he had panicked and pushed her off. The jury agreed and found him guilty. On July the 21st, 1976, Donald Nielsen was convicted of the murder of Leslie Whittle. Sentencing him to life imprisonment, the judge emphasized, in your case, life must mean life. <laughs>